everyone, and welcome to another episode. Today, I am going to talk about something all by myself, um, which is a little different. And it is a question that I get quite a lot. And also, it involves a lot of misconceptions. I am going to talk about the similarities and the differences between sheep and goats. A lot of people think that they are very much the same animal, but they're not. There's, there's actually a lot of things that are different about them. But first, let me go ahead and start with the things that are the same about them. Now, one thing is that some people may just automatically think that uh, sheep are for wool and goats are for dairy. But the reality is that both of those species come in varieties that have been bred specifically for meat, some have been bred for dairy, and some have been bred for fiber. So in terms of sheep, we have um, hair sheep, we also have some wool sheep that have been bred specifically for meat. And that basically just means that they've got a really good feed to meat conversion ratio. Now, of course you can eat any sheep, you can eat any goat, but the ones that are bred specifically for meat are simply gonna give you more meat. Same with dairy. All of these animals are mammals and so they all make milk but the ones that have been bred for dairy are going to produce a lot more and they're going to have a much nicer mammary system so if you compare a boar or a kiko goat's mammary system to the mammary system of an alpine or a sonnen or a nigerian dwarf they are going to be very different you will find um, things on meat goat udders and teats that would be disqualifications in the show ring for dairy goats like you might find extra teats you might find udders that um, are very poorly supported so they're just like really baggy instead of having really good support and they're not going to produce nearly as much milk there are some meat goats are barely able to produce enough milk to feed their kids through a lactation. You hear some people say like, oh, sheep will wean their lambs, but goats won't. Well, it's not about them weaning them. It's about how long they can produce milk. And so your typical wool or meat sheep and your meat goats only produce milk for a few months, like three or four or five months. I've heard of some meat goats only producing milk for two or three months. And of course, that's not even a good thing if you're raising them for meat, because they're not going to raise their kids to be as big and meaty as a goat that has a better milk supply. Dairy goats um, can be used for meat. And in fact, weathered dairy goats, which are castrated males, do wind up as meat very often. Now, the amount of meat that you're going to get from them is not nearly as good as the amount of meat that you're going to get from a boar or a Kiko or one of the other meat breeds. But what else is there to do with a lot of weathered dairy goats other than to use them for meat? We even butcher some of our Nigerian dwarf weathers and the meat is delicious, but you don't get very much. I'm sure boar goat breeders and Kiko breeders would just laugh at me, you know, when I say, oh yeah, you can get 25 pounds hanging weight from an eight month old Nigerian dwarf, like 25 pounds hanging weight, they would be saying, why bother? But you know, if we've got extra weathers that don't sell as pets or brush eaters, then that's what we do with them. Um, fiber, it can all, you can get fiber from both of these species. Sheep, of course, produce wool. And for goats, all goats produce cashmere. So if you want to know why a cashmere sweater or a cashmere coat is so expensive, it's because you're only going to get a few ounces from a single goat. Some goats are specifically bred for cashmere and they'll produce a little more, but still not a ton. So that's why it's very expensive. The main fiber goat is the Angora and Angora goats produce a fiber called mohair and they actually produce way more than sheep do. And they have to be sheared twice a year for that reason. So if you want meat specifically or dairy specifically or fiber specifically, you can get those things from both species depending on what breed you wanna get. Now, some people talk about dual purpose or triple purpose and it's kind of a misnomer because none of them are going to be as good as a breed that's bred specifically for a single purpose. So for example, the kinder goat is meant to be a dual purpose meat and dairy goat, 
but it's not going to produce anywhere close to as much meat as a meat goat breed. And it's not going to produce as much milk as a dairy goat breed, but it's a nice combination of the two. And for somebody that wants meat and dairy, both, that's a good option. Some people think that, that sheep and goats are so similar that they can just house them together. But one of the reasons that some people don't want to put them together is because they can get the same diseases. CAE is this in goats is the same as OPP in sheep. So maybe you have spent a lot of time getting a herd of goats that is CAE free. And then you go out and buy sheep and those sheep could bring OPP onto your farm and wind up infecting your goats with CAE, which would not be a good thing. They can also, both species also get yonis, which is spelled with a J. Both of them also can get cassius lymphadenitis, usually called CL. They can both get scrapey. They can both get sore mouth, which is also called ORF, O-R-F sometimes. And they both get the same worms, especially that really horrible worm that we have spent so much time talking about on this podcast. And that is the barber pole worm. The scientific name is Homonchus contortus. And so if you've got them together, then they could wind up getting each other sick. If, if you bring in some of them that have one of these diseases, the other species could get it. And now before we get into the differences between the different species, I want to take a quick break and thank our sponsor for this episode, Stanley Premium Western Forage. If you've been listening for a while, you know how much I love their alfalfa pellets and their grass hay pellets. I guess I should say that our goats, sheep, and pigs actually love the hay pellets because I don't eat them, but I love the fact that my animals love them so much. We use their alfalfa pellets for our milking does when they're on the milk stand to slow them down so that the grain hogs don't get sick from eating too much grain while they're milking. And our ewes also love the alfalfa pellets after lambing so that they can get all the calcium they need to produce plenty of milk for their babies. And our bucks enjoy the grass hay pellets during those winter months when we can't find enough grass hay for them because too much alfalfa is not good for male goats. To learn more, visit stanleyforage.com. And now back to our episode. Let's talk about the differences between sheep and goats. The number one thing that most people talk about is that they have different copper needs. Goats need a lot of copper and sheep are actually very sensitive to copper toxicosis. So a goat mineral should have about 1800 ppm of copper in it if it's got around 20% or so salt. If it's got a much higher level of copper, it should also have a higher level of salt to slow down their consumption. On the flip side with the sheep, a lot of sheep minerals have no copper in them at all. And if they have any, it's going to be like around 30 or 40 ppm. And that is what you usually see if you see something labeled sheep and goat minerals is it's the amount of copper in there is probably going to be around 30, 40, 50 ppm, which to a goat, that is nothing because for minerals, they're only usually, they're only going to consume about a third to a half of an ounce a day. And that's why the copper level in there for goats needs to be around 1700, 1800 or so. So you can't have them together and expect that they're both going to do well on the same mineral. Um, if you do have them in a pasture together, then you at least need to put them in the barn in different stalls at night so that you can have the different minerals in there. They don't have to have it available 24 hours a day. They can get what they need during the overnight hours. Sheep and goats also eat different foods. Sheep are grazers and goats are browsers. If you want to get super, super picky, they're actually like intermediate browsers because they will eat some grass, but Ideally, they should eat browse, which is bushes and small trees and things like that. And this is one reason that sheep have better parasite resistance. Throughout history, sheep have been eating off the ground. So their bodies have been accustomed to consuming worm larvae. Goats, on the other hand, have been used to eating up here in front of their face. There's an old saying that goats should never eat below their knees. And that's because that's where all of the worm eggs are. And so if you try to force goats to become grazers like sheep, then you're going to have more of a challenge with worms and you're going to have to really, really be much better about rotational grazing. And that's another thing too, with the minerals, goats have much higher mineral needs in general. 
you can get away with not having minerals available for sheep all the time. In fact, we frequently run out of minerals in our sheep pasture and our sheep are fine. Goats, on the other hand, like it is not optional. If you don't have minerals out there for your goats, you are going to have problems with infertility and worms are going to be worse if they're uh, mineral deficient. And so it's just not an option for goats. You absolutely have to have a really excellent goat mineral, specifically goat mineral, not sheep and goat, to keep your goats healthy. The next thing is that they speak different languages. Goats rear up on their hind legs to butt heads. Sheep, on the other hand, will put their head down and charge at their opponent. This is like one time I had a school call me and say that they were thinking of getting, the children wanted a goat and a sheep. Um, for their little farm school or school farm. And so they wanted to get one of each. And I explained to them that it really doesn't work if you only, if you have one of each, because um, they don't speak the same language. So it, it actually, it's pretty funny. Usually when they're in the same pasture together, they ignore each other. But on the rare occasion when two of them have a disagreement and they're in the same pasture, it's really funny to see the goat rearing up on their hind legs and the sheep running at them with their head down because they just don't connect the way that they're expecting to. Another thing that is different is that breeding is very different for both of these. And that's because birthing is different. With breeding sheep, most people just pen breed. And that means that you put all of your ewes into a pen that you want to breed to one ram. You put the ram in there and he breeds them. Or what you can also do if you don't have multiple pens or pastures to put them in for breeding is that you get a marking harness. And so the, the rams wear a harness. And so like this ram is got a red marker and this ram has a green marker and this ram has a blue marker. And that's how you know who bred a particular ewe. And if she's got multiple marks on her, well, then you're not going to be able to register the offspring unless you get DNA testing because you, you won't know which one is actually the sire of those babies. Now with um, goat breeding, people are much more likely to um, hand breed, which is not as nearly as involved as that sounds. All you're doing is you are waiting to see the doe come into heat. And when she comes into heat, you basically set her up on a date. So like, I know I want to breed a specific doe to Monarch. So when that doe comes into heat, I put her in a stall in the barn. I go out to the buck pen. I get Monarch. I bring them in. I put them together for the day. And then um, tomorrow I take him back out again. So I know Monarch is going to be the sire of those kids. And I can count forward 145 to 150 days for my Nigerian dwarfs. If you have standard size goats, you can go up to 155 days so that you've got a small window there for kidding. And the reason that most goat breeders like this is because goats do not give birth the way sheep do. I have raised goats since 2002 and I've raised sheep since 2003 and I try very hard to be at every single goat birth because if I'm not, the mortality rate is going to be really high. And that is simply because a lot of does, I call them divas because they just lay there like and, and just think like, well, my job is just to push the kid out. You're supposed to clean it up for me. And so if you're not there to clean up the kid, there is a chance that the um, amniotic sac doesn't break during the birth. And if it doesn't break, the kid will suffocate if the mom doesn't rip it off. Now I have a beautiful um, set of photos of a ewe. I call them first fresheners when they're goats, um, but it was a first lambing ewe and she gives birth to this lamb and she just pops right up, spins around and starts to rip the sack off of the baby. Like she just knew what to do. Unfortunately, a lot of goats don't have that instinct anymore. So a lot of them just lay there and they just spit them out. I well, There was one time we missed a birth and we got there pretty close to when the doe had actually given birth. She was still laying down. There were two kids that were standing up and toddling around and there were two kids still in the sack, like right there at the exit, like right under her tail. 
Like she had pushed them out. The sex did not break on those two kids and they were dead because they suffocated. Like they never had a chance because she didn't rip the sacks off. The other reason that we need to be there when the goat kids are born is because of hypothermia. We're in Illinois and if it is below freezing, we're having, you know, three pound kids. And it, if they are soaking wet and they just have hair, you know, like we do just plain old hair, that's not very insulating. There's a very good chance that they could get hypothermia. Um, with the sheep, it, I don't know what the minimum temperature is for sheep to be able to do that. This year we had temperatures in the single digits one night when we had a lamb born and it was completely fine. Um, one thing about goats, it's easier to know when they're really close to kidding because you can feel their tail ligaments with sheep, whether it's hair sheep or wool sheep, you cannot feel their tail ligaments because they have this really thick padding around um, at the back end of their spine where the tail starts. I think that's probably the reason that sheep breeders no, don't talk about that. Um, I know as a goat breeder, it's something that I thought, oh, why don't people do this? And I'm going to do it. And um, I, I couldn't find them like, because everything just feels like mush when you have all that massive padding on there. Another thing that is really different about sheep and goats is the way that they, the babies will take a bottle. Now with kids, if you try to give a bottle to a kid that has been dam raised, it is going to scream and kick and act like you are trying to poison it because it has no idea what to do with the bottle. And even when they're first born, it can be challenging to get them to take the first few bottles for them to learn how to do it. They catch on to nursing most of the time, like boom, no problem. But trying to get a goat baby to take a bottle is usually a nightmare. We used to be on milk test. And one thing that I hated about milk test with a herd that was dam raised is that once every month we had to separate those kids for 24 hours and give them a bottle while their mom was on test. And it was horribly stressful. There were years back then that we had 50, 60 kids. And I pretty much spent my whole day out there just getting covered from head to toe in milk, trying to get these kids to take a bottle because they couldn't nurse during the milk test because we had to show how much milk the moms were making. And that's actually one of the reasons that we quit milk testing because I just did not have the time to devote the whole day to trying to get milk into these babies that um, couldn't nurse during the milk testing period. Lambs, on the other hand, it's amazing to me how lambs just boom, you want me to take a bottle? Sure. In fact, to just give you an example of how easy it is to give a lamb a bottle, a year ago um, before COVID, I was traveling and when I came home, my husband said to me, oh, by the way, one of the sheep gave birth and there's a problem um, that you need to be, we need, we're, we start giving the baby a bottle. I don't remember the circumstances anymore. I think he was, cause we weigh all of our babies. And so I think the baby just wasn't gaining. Um, there was a problem with the, the used milk supply. So he said, I needed to give it a bottle. And in passing, you know, he's telling me this is he's rushing out to work as I'm getting home from the airport. And I misunderstood which pen that ram lamb was in. And so when it was feeding time, I go out there with the bottle and I walk into the second kidding pen slash lambing pen and I pick up this ram lamb and I tickle its lips with the nipple and it grabs it and starts sucking and sucks down the whole bottle like it was just starving and I'm so proud of myself like you know job done <laughs> go back in the house and the next day when my husband was home I discovered I had given a bottle to the wrong lamb that lamb did not need a bottle that lamb was gaining weight like gangbusters like he didn't need the bottle at all the one that needed the bottle was in the first pen not the second pen and that never would have happened with a goat you know with a goat this kid would have been kicking and screaming and milk would have been going everywhere and i would have been texting my husband saying how, how many times have you given this kid a bottle how hard is it and hopefully it would have come out then that i had the wrong baby Overall, 
sheep are easier. Like I know the name of the podcast is for the love of goats and I do love goats. They are my favorite animal on the farm. And you are probably wondering at this point saying, why on earth do you have goats? <laughs> like, why don't you just have sheep? Um, why does anybody have goats? Well, there are some things that are a little harder to quantify. Um, and the bottom line is that um, I have goats for multiple reasons. Um, I prefer their milk. I prefer their cheese. Well, actually, I don't prefer their yogurt. Sheep yogurt is better. Um, the yogurt is all about the butter fat. And so that is why I love our Nigerian dwarf yogurt because it the butter fat for Nigerian dwarfs is around averages breed wise, it averages six and a half percent. But like we know since we were on milk test that in the middle of winter, our butter fats are around nine or ten percent, which is the same as butter fat for sheep milk. So I do love sheep milk yogurt. Um, so the sheep milk yogurt is, is my favorite, but the goat milk yogurt is second. But I like the all the other cheese um, for goats I like better. I like goat meat better. It's a milder taste than lamb. I love lamb. That's why we have um, sheep. We've, we, had, we raised Shetlands for 12 years, which are a wool breed. We have had Katahdin's for um, six years now. And that's a hair sheep that is used for meat and they're delicious. And we have, I may be the only person that's ever been crazy enough to try to milk Shetlands. Um, we've also milked our Katahdin's at times so that we could make yogurt with their milk because we really like it. The other thing is I really prefer the personality of goats. If you wanted to make a comparison, goats are more like dogs. They're just much more friendly, whereas sheep are more like cats. You can win them over, but they're a lot more aloof. And so I, I just like the personality of goats. I, it would have been really easy for me to quit 15 years ago when our goats were dying and not getting pregnant because unfortunately that time I did not realize that we had a problem with copper deficiency. And um, we also wound up with complete dewormer resistance in our goats. And so we've had, we've had a ton more problems with our goats, but that's also how I wound up becoming a goat expert because it was just a matter of, am I going to give up or am I going to figure out why my goats are dying, why they're not getting pregnant, and, and keep moving forward. And that was the answer because simply because I love them so much. And that's why a lot of people have goats. They just have the most charming personalities. They produce wonderful milk and cheese and the meat is good and, and we just love them. That's it for today's episode. If you've got any questions, feel free to post in the comment section below. Thanks so much. See you again next week.